Well, the broadcast what? is live now. Welcome to the Ignatius Press author interview show. This is my first attempt at it, and also our author, Father Simeon Erasmo Leva Merikakis. You can't see the Kakis on there, but it's that's a full name there. Uh, and uh, I am the founder and editor of Ignatius Press, and Father Simeon is very close to being the founding translator of our press, and also one of the founding members of the St. Ignatius Institute, which I was directing at the time that I met Erasmo. And dear Father Simeon, let's reminisce on the first time we met. Well, first of all, how do we meet at all? Ignatius Press began because we wanted to publish the works of the great European authors, de Lubac, von Balthasar, Ratzinger, Boyer, and that required translation. And so when we began to do translation, I got a postcard from Hans Urson Balthasar, one of his typical little postcards, saying uh, there's a young graduate student in Emory University uh, in Georgia who will, will be a fine translator. And so I contacted you. And what was the first book you translated? Heart of the World. Heart of the World. Our very first book, although it came out a month after Bouillet's book, Woman in the Church, but still in print still a glorious book. And then uh, when we began the St. Ignatius Institute, we were looking for faculty and we decided to try and bring in uh, then Erasmo uh, to University of San Francisco. And I recall in those days, we used to say morning prayer in St. Ignatius Church on the left-hand side, the Marian little altar there. And uh, we were just finishing morning prayer and you walked up the side aisle of St. Church, bleary-eyed from an all-night bus trip. And that was when I first, and I remember your eyes were like little pin pricks uh, <laughs> because you, you were so tired. It, it, correction, not an all-night. If you remember, I'm coming from Atlanta to San Francisco yes. by yes. Greyhound bus. So it was more like four nights uh, of on and off sleeping on the buses. Yes, well, <laughs> and that was the beginning of a long friendship Oh, it's been 16 years, I think, since we've actually talked. You've been lived a more eremitic life there as a uh, Trappist, uh, whereas I, although I'm a Jesuit, I've become kind of a recluse. But let's get to these books. Now, there's actually, there's actually, we see them here. We have four volumes here, okay, <laughs> on Matthew's Gospel. And, uh, you know, volume one... Uh, was published in 1996, and it has 746 pages, uh, and it gets as far as Matthew chapter 11, verse 29C. Now, by dividing these verses up into A, B, C, D, he was able to make it even longer, you know, because he comments on on the subversive. But uh, Father Simeon Erasmo, uh, what led you to want to write a commentary on St. Matthew's Gospel? It's uh, it's a serendipitous story, Father Fessio, because I was in uh, with my family in the south of France uh, on my first sabbatical year from the University of San Francisco. So that was in 1983. And um, I had another project, a much more academic and serious, you know, kind of uh, yeah, intellectual project on Catholic prophecy. I wanted to write a book on Flannery O'Connor and Léon Blois and modern Catholic prophecy. This was actually my project. Oh, yeah. Uh, would, I, would, the, I, would I have been in that book? Would you have been? Well, maybe. <laughs> in, yes, in, in the acknowledgments page. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> well, in the acknowledgments page, I have a lot to acknowledge to you. Just a little footnote here for bringing me to San Francisco. This is why transplanted from Georgia, uh, two of my children were born in San Francisco. I lived there for almost 30 years. I had a whole career at the University of San Francisco and with the press. And it's really all because of you, because of that letter to von Balthasar and his postcard to you. That's where it all started. So this is a long story. We, we've been through yeah, a lot. Yeah, 40 years. A anyway, so the, the origin of this volume one which I have here also. So I was supposed to write that book. And uh, 
so I worked on that in the mornings, you know, doing research. My personal project that year was in the afternoons, I wanted to read the whole New Testament in Greek. Uh, I've read a lot in the New Testament in Greek, but I wanted to do the whole New Testament in Greek. Uh, for, and of course, the, the first thing in the New Testament is the Gospel of Matthew, as we all know. But that was just a personal thing. And as I started reading that meditatively in the afternoon, I when I read, I take little notes. So I began <laughs> just taking down jottings on the genealogy uh, uh, in Matthew. And to make a long story short, little jottings became slowly complete sentences and sentences became paragraphs. And at the same time, a monastery of Benedictine women down there near Aix-en-Provence at Jouk, and this was almost Advent time in 1983, they invited me to give them conferences. And I said, what shall I talk about? And then I looked at these notes on the gospel. I said, perfect, it's the beginning of the gospel of Matthew. I'll talk to the nuns about this. So that added a little steam. And then the, the notes became paragraphs, became conferences. And truly, before I knew it, I was writing a book. I did not intend to write a book on Matthew or anything else. It happened. All right. And then uh, did we propose to you or you proposed to us that we finally published it or what? Recall? <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't want to publish it. <laughs> I, uh, how, it took me several years to finish the manuscript to where it was sizable enough to say. And so I gave it to, to Carolyn Lemon. Uh, and uh, Carolyn liked it. And uh, I mean, I don't know whether you liked it or not, but I, I, I didn't think that you thought it was sellable. And, um, but then you said something like, well, you're one of our translators. I can, say, I can tell you've done a lot of work on this. We'll get, you know, here goes nothing kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> but we were still a young press at the time. And, you know, most of yes. were trying, trying to publish these translations. And, you know, let's face it, this is a huge book. <laughs> and it it's is. a book with a lot of Greek in it. It's even got, it's even got Hebrew in it. We got the Alpha, Alpha, yes. just a little yeah. mark yeah, between the, the paragraphs there. Yeah. You know, you've got Greek in here. And it's, yep. you know, 700 pages and more. It's a big, thick brick. And we just thought that, well, okay, it's worth, it's very worthwhile. It's a beautiful meditative book, but who's going to buy this thing? You know, especially it would be, it would be costly. But as it turned out, it, it did surprise all of us, not because we didn't think it was good, but because it, it elicited so much positive response. We sold, I mean, I don't know how many printing, we've done many printings of this book. But then, of course, so that was 1996. So you started in 83, so it took you 13 years to get volume one and to go through the first 11 chapters. And of course, we thought, well, Matthew, you know, there's 28 chapters, so this has got 11. Well, maybe we'll get a, we'll get a second volume out of this, you know? <laughs> yeah, for the rest of Matthew. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. And so then you went on and we get volume two, which is which is a slender 668 pages, you know? What a full... that's, that's the shortest one. That's the shortest it one. It is. And, and it got to Matthew 1833. So we got seven, we got seven verses only in that. Uh, so uh, uh, chapters. And then, so that was seven years later. And then nine years after that, we get volume three, which is <laughs> 870 pages. That's the largest of them all. Which goes up to Matthew 25, 45. Now, we only got two and a half chapters left. So we said, okay, well, the last volume will be a slim one, right? It was. <laughs> it's fairly fairly slim comparatively, but it's 684 pages. Now, I, I don't want to discourage people from uh, buying and reading this book, but it's not a book you read from beginning to end. This is a book that's on your prayer stand, your nightstand, you know, in the chapel where you use it for your meditation, right? Yeah, and you know, I, I always like, there's a favorite quote of mine to justify myself and my word wordiness, I guess, from uh, Gregory the Great, uh, who says in one of his commentaries on scripture, you know, he, he says, uh, verbum crescit cum legente, the word grows with the reader, 
or with the act of reading. Yeah. I said, I like that. You know, I like, yeah, and, you know, and it's true. I mean, it's, it's kind of a justification, but at the same time, the word of God, you know, and this is what enthralls me. It's so rich that it brings forth, you know, it's planted in you. It's planted in each one of us. And things begin growing out of us that we didn't even know were in us. You know, this kind of symbiosis of the word with my soul and with my faith. It's an amazing thing that to watch happen, you know, and it multiplies. Yeah. That's called a self-fulfilling prophecy that uh, the word grows with reading, that you made that prophecy and then you fulfilled it. <laughs> but... <laughs> but, 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 you know, believe me, Carolyn, Carolyn Lemon... <clears throat> wonderful editor that she is, uh, uh, really liked the book. But in between volumes, she was always trying to kind of, you know, uh, di I guess, discipline me a little bit and say, now, remember that we have to, we have to uh, be a little economical here with words. So please try to little, be a little more succinct. And I would make every uh, good, you know, uh, resolution attempt. in the book, attempt. Yeah. But I don't know. My style is my style. And then Car Carolyn yeah. finally said, do what you need to do, we'll, and we'll see what we do with it. You know. By the way, for our listeners and viewers, uh, Carolyn Lemon is the woman who is still here, uh, as I am so far. We're both in our 80s. Uh, and with me, she founded Ignatius Press back in 1978. She's our production editor. But here at Ignatius Press, we're kind of a family. And uh, everybody who's here also reads our managers, reads our books. So it's not just that you're here as a functionary or some kind of a staff job. We're all book lovers, lovers of the church. And so it's another thing, Erasmo, whenever we don't have focus groups, you know, we don't, you know, we don't send out books to manuscripts to people who re review them. If we like it, we think it'll help the church, we publish it and let, let things fall where they may. And for 43 years, pretty much every year, uh, more money has come in than has gone out. So we're still here, you know. <laughs> now, uh, Father Simeon, or I, I have to keep calling you Erasmo because I knew you as Erasmo, the labor of uh, Oh, I will say to our viewers and listeners here, uh, Erasmo is a very good translator. Uh, he's one of those people that makes you very angry if you've ever tried to learn a language because he speaks several of them and he can go from one to another in, in mid-sentence. Whereas, although I spent time in France and Germany and Italy, when I try and speak or write, it's it's a it's a quick translation. Is what is it? I'm not really speaking; I'm translating. So, but this is in Greek, and that se second part of your last name there, which is not quite fully showing up on my screen, it's Mary Kakis. So, explain to us your Greek roots. Yes. Uh First of all, why do I have the two names with a hyphen? It's because in, in the Spanish tradition, all over the Hispanic world, Spain and Latin America, uh, we keep our mother's maiden name as a, we call it a second last name. And so we keep both, even though you would be listed under the, I would be listed under the L, the fathers. The first one is the father and then the mother. Anyway, so my father is Cuban and Leva is a very Spanish name. Merikakis is an extremely Greek name. Uh, my mother was a Greek American. She was first generation in this country, but both of her parents, my grandparents, emigrated from Greece at the beginning of the 20th century uh, to, to this very state of Massachusetts where I am now. They emigrated here not far away. And so I've had, even though Spanish and English were really my first two languages, Greek was always sort of in the air. Whenever we visited my grandparents, especially when I came to this country from Cuba, I lived with them. And so I have a love, I mean, I am Greek and I heard Greek, learned the alphabet early on. And so I got that in my uh, in my DNA, so to speak. And I think that in this, in this work, it kind of <laughs> uh, came to full life, so to speak, because when I, when I deal with the Greek texts, I always think of my grandparents. For me, it's an extremely personal thing to read the gospel out loud in Greek. And what it evokes is not, you know, some ancient dusty site or something. It evokes my grandmother's kitchen. And she and my grandfather speaking to Greek 
in Greek with one another. And so it's it's a matter of the heart for me, the gospel in Greek. Well, you know, in chemistry, a polymer is a many-parted molecule, because poly means many and mer means part in Greek. Yes. And, and a bad sound is cacophony, because kakos means bad and phony is sound. So you are Mary Caucus. Now, does that mean partly bad or the bad part or what's what's the etymology of your name <laughs> i i don't that that, that ending akis akis is a typical like uh nikos kazansakis the famous uh yeah. writer uh theodorakis it's a typical greek ending but that ending akis originally comes from the island of crete it, it's really it's a name it, it's a place name ending Merikakis. even though my grandparents didn't come from crete but the name did. We know that. And uh, as for a more literal meaning, I don't know. But I don't. I don't think it's. I hope it isn't what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're all partly bad, so. That, of course, that could, of course, only okay. part, partly, half and half. So to get to the, let's take the. Well, let's not take the fourth one. Let's take the whole series here. Uh, you pick Matthew's gospel. I mean. Not for any, it was just the first gospel, right? It, 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 really, that's that's the reason. But, but, but it, that it, having, wasn't, it wasn't written in Greek, apparently, for, originally, right? It was originally Aramaic. There is a pretty substantial theory that it was written in Aramaic. Yeah. But the thing is, it, it's a theory, it's a probable hypo hypothesis. But the thing is that what we've had from the beginning, the church, Right. is the Greek text, the Koine Greek of, of Matthew. Even if, in a sense, it's a translation, uh, uh, you see, we, al we already have, um, as part of the, for instance, when Matthew quotes the Old Testament, and obviously Matthew quotes the Old Testament a lot, because he's, he's writing probably to a, um, a Jewish Christian community, and so it's the most Jewish of the Gospels, and he's very, very eager to prove everything about our Lord as the fulfillment of promises made to, to Israel. So he's continually, continually quoting the Old Testament. When he does that, usually he quotes the Old Testament not according to the Hebrew text, but according to the Greek Septuagint, which is the, the Jewish translation into Greek of the Old Testament. It's pre-Christian, but that's the text that Matthew was using. Now, whether this was the translation of Aramaic Matthew or what, we don't know that, but I'm very happy that it comes in Greek even from the Old Testament, you see. Did, did you find in your going through Matthew's Greek what seemed to be Aramaisms to you? I mean- all the, all the time, all the time. But we find those, you, you know, you know, expressions like, it came to pass, uh, you know, it became is really what it says. Th but you find that you find that in all the New Testament, in Paul too, because these are all Semitic roots that all these early Christians had, but particularly in Matthew, particularly in Matthew. Then what, uh, any particular parts of Matthew, which because of the Greek, uh, you found more, more illumination in or... Is it? Would you just say the gospel is is good from beginning to end? As uh... I, yeah, I mean yes. I would say I I don't think any one part. I mean there are moments in the gospel, you know. For instance, at the very end, at the very end of volume one, uh, and that's really. I mean, not only did I have enough pages, but you know the 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 very ending, Matthew eleven you know, 28, 29, uh, come to me, all you who are weary, and I will give you rest. Learn from me because I am gentle and humble of heart. Uh, the, the, um, a, a great uh, Matthew comment, uh, commentator has said that that is the, the, the gem, the jewel of Matthew's gospel. It's very Johannine. It's not really in keeping with the, it's, it's because it's so interior, it's very mystical, it's very affective and so forth. You know, I mean, I like that passage in, in particular, which, you know, who doesn't prefer a passage like that? But the thing is that Matthew can have that 
in the middle of all sorts of talk about the law, the fulfillment of the law, I have not come to uh, abolish the law, but to fulfill it and so forth. So I, I think that in a sense, Matthew has it all. He has the, the, the concerns about the fulfillment of the law, but also the mysticism, we would call it, of, of St. John um, in a passage like that. So in Matthew, I'm pretty sure, was the most commented gospel in the, in the Middle Ages. Uh, and whereas our friend von Balthasar, I think he would probably take John's gospel as sort of the center of his own reflection. I know St. Dominic, I mean, that was what he carried with him was Matthew's gospel. He memorized it pretty much from beginning to end. Uh, how, how would you suggest that people profit best from these commentaries of yours? Okay. Uh, first of all, I I'd like to say one more word, if I may, about oh, sure. Greek. Uh, yeah. About Greek. Uh, mm, not personal, but the. Uh, it, once it was obvious that I was writing a book, and as I said, it took a while for me to discover, oh, I think I'm writing a book. Once I made that choice, I am going to continue, and now I'm going to write it as a book. Um, I wanted to say, well, what kind of a book is this going to be? Um, and obviously personality, personal tastes have a lot to do with that, but also who am I writing this for? And um, I think that in the end, you have to say, this is not original to me, but many people have said, you end up writing the book that, you have been, that you've been looking for but cannot find. <laughs> you end up writing it yourself. And something like that happened to me. Uh, why? Because for scriptural commentaries, other than the fathers of the church, you know, uh, Origen and Jerome and Gregory the Great and John Chrysostom and all that, but other than the fathers of the church, I have found my most modern commentaries on the gospel in particular disappointing in the sense that they're much too technical. If you want to read a commentary for spiritual purposes, that is to say, to, to deepen your understanding of the person of the Lord, or to, to fuel your prayer, your heart, as well as your mind, you're hard put to find commentaries that will do that, because most of them are extremely academic and extremely technical. They're very useful, but not if you're looking for a prayer aid or a booster. Okay, that's that's one extreme. And the other extreme was the, the kind of popularization preaching of the gospel in which, you know, some image reminds you of something and then you say anything at all that you want about the gospel. That's too sloppy. So it, the extremes were the ultra academic or the, to me, sloppy. So I said, there's got to be another way. And for me, the way was kind of the objectivity of the Greek text. You know, I am a teacher of literature, I am a grammarian, and I try not to bore people in the book. I don't think I bore them, and I don't do it on every page. But when I think it's relevant to pursue the etymology of a word or to point out uh, the, the relevance of a verb tense or the voice, is it active, is it passive, the voice, I do that, but always carefully. I explain what I'm doing, and I have very much in mind, I am talking mostly to people who do not know Greek. So I'm very conscious of that. And But I'm pretty good at translating. I'm a translator. Yes, you by, are. By nature. Uh, yes. Translating not only, <laughs> not, not only one lam language to another, but translating, I guess, concepts or showing the importance of a grammatical turn. And that really turned me on, the, 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 uh, the, the relevance. You know, if this is the word of God, let's not get too spiritual about it. It's this, these are the words that providentially the Lord gave us forever in the church as the, the, the means or the entryway to the knowledge of the Son. To the, to the rebel who reveals to us the Father. So I take words very seriously, you see. Well, um, let's, let's go back to that for just a moment, because I think it's important. Uh, you mentioned the kind of extremes of the, of the highly academic uh, historical critical method, let's call it, 
you know, and then the the fan, fantastical where you just kind of go off on your own ideas and what happens. Yeah. Uh, uh, and I, Balthazar has said somewhere, uh, at least once, and Ratzinger as well, uh, that that we can learn much from the re results of the historical critical method over the last couple of centuries. However, it should always give us a greater appreciation and understanding of the word, not less. It shouldn't restrict us uh, as if we can't find the real Jesus because now we're not sure whether it was in Q or whether it was, you know, uh, a redactor or something like that. But uh, Pope Benedict in this masterful little trilogy on Jesus, in two at least of the introductions, makes it very clear. In fact, he says it in his, his kind of humorous, ironic way. He says, uh, we, we historical critical methods have given us a lot of benefit, but they've kind of reached their term now. There's not much more to squeeze out of that sponge. Uh, <laughs> and he, I think, gives a, a masterful way of integrating the, the knowledge that comes from the scientific, you know, historical studies to the spiritual meaning, the patristic interpretation, uh, what the mystics and what the prayer of the church has, has discovered over the centuries. And I think uh, with you, with in this book, historical critical uh, research is there, but it's not there on the surface. It's there because you know what they've said about this. And that kind of, uh, in a certain sense, gives a certain uh, structure or limitation to what you're going to say. Uh, but if you prayerfully reflect on what the language actually says, what it means, you know, and you also, of course, Erasmo, you know, are very familiar with the fathers of the church and particularly Origen, let's say, is a, is a great example of a Bible commentator. Uh, so that's, it's all in here, but it doesn't seem like it's scholarly. It just seems like you're reading the text and reflecting on it. Yeah. It's, it's sort of like, uh, it's like like praying praying on paper, something like that, because it you know because it it, it means so much to me, um, and, and you know the in that sense too the word grows with the reader. In other words, words the, the word wants to be shared, uh, and and I have a sense of uh, as I as I write and meditate, I have a sense of terrific communion of entering more deeply into the communion of saints, both living and, and dead, it, it, in the sense that it's the word that gives us life. And these are the very words, you know, that all of the generations of the church, both scholars and saints and everybody, preachers, have uh, uh, started with this text in order to, to nourish their preaching, their meditation. And that's, to, I'm in awe of that. I mean, that's tremendously moving to, to have the privilege of being one more witness, if you want, of the, up to the power uh, of, of the word. Yes, and uh, I, I, I don't want to, listen, maybe get edited out by Kate, uh, but often when I'm reading the gospel at Mass and then preaching it, I just, I can't stop myself from saying before I begin to give my homily, take that, Mohammed. I mean, I've read the Quran, okay? And there's a lot of beautiful things in the Quran. Most of them come from the Old Testament uh, and part of the New Testament. But uh, I know someone could possibly, uh, on a on a bet, have a commentary like this on the first 12 surahs of the Quran or something like that. But the gospel, I mean, it is so rich. It's so deep. It's so multidimensional that, I mean, you could have made these books even longer. Oh, yeah. You know? Oh, yeah. I had to... You know what you're saying there. I think that what you're saying is very true due to the mystery of Christ. It's the mystery yes. of yeah. the presence of Christ. And I think it's from Balthasar, you know, who, who, who speaks of, I, th I think, I don't think I'm inventing this. He speaks of the miracle of the text of the gospel, the miracle of the text. And, and he means something very specific by that. He doesn't only mean it's so beautiful and so inspiring. He means something theological. He means that if Jesus Christ is the incarnate God 
and reveals the Father, who in and of himself is unknowable, infinite, uncircumscribable, and so forth, and nevertheless Jesus embodies him, well, then the gospel text is like an incarnation or in paper and, and human, human words of the divine word. And that's what he means, that biblical inspiration is that, that we experience the incarnation of the infinite unseen God in audible, visible, finite human words. And that the communication, the communication of the inner being of God and Jesus is effective. I mean, it's so strong that it knocks us over and it burns us up like fire. That's the miracle of the text. Fire of mercy, part of the world. This should be yes. a good place to conclude, but I'm not going to conclude yet because I want to have you comment on something else here. And that is that, you know, you, you've seen these courses on the Bible as literature. Uh, but I would say that the Greek of Matthew's gospel and all the gospels is not great literature. I mean, you actually find m more literary forms in the Old Testament, you know, the Song of Songs, the book of Job. So uh, in relation to what you just said, uh, it, it, it's paradoxical but very beautiful that the depth comes not because it's a masterpiece of literature, but because of Christ himself. And Origen says, Origen says on that very point, he speaks of the humility of the text. Yes, yes. In other, in other words, what else did you expect? Would you expect Virgil's Aeneid, you know, perfectly balanced uh, uh, poetic periods to matter? No, just as the Lord of armies became incarnate in Jesus of Nazareth, the carpenter uh, of Nazareth. So, and and that non masterpiece literary form, the the critics, I forget who it was, called it sermo piscatorius, sermo piscatorius, fisherman talk, <laughs> fish yeah. fisherman talk, and well, that's I, what it is. I remember reading uh, the great Bruce Metzger. Uh, who was a great lower criticism. Lower criticism is when you're actually going into the grammar of the words. And, you know, we don't have any actual text of, written by Matthew. We have these copies of copies of copies. And so there's all these variant readings. Well, I was surprised to find that there are 33,000 variant readings in the New Testament. That's more than there are words. So in a certain sense, it's like Jesus passing through their midst. I mean, what is the New Testament, you know? Go ahead. I, I mean, your your mention of Bruce Metzger, I love Bruce Metzger, if only for one reason. In the parable of the virgins, of the ten virgins, the five wise and the five foolish in Matthew, yeah. he has a wonderful, really, it's a substantial footnote, because there are certain manuscripts of the parable that when the bridegroom, the, 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 the brides go out to meet and the text says, the bridegroom. There are some manuscripts that say they go out to meet the bridegroom and the bride because of the oddity of having a wedding without a bride, you see. <laughs> but Bruce, Bruce Metzger, in that footnote, which I include uh, uh, in my book, I think I should have <laughs> if I didn't. No, he says that there is good reason why it speaks only of a bridegroom and not of the bride, because the original text of the gospel was already doing an allegorical interpretation on the nature of the church, and it's the church herself, or the, the brides who are going to meet the bridegroom who collectively constitute the bride, because it's a divine wedding of God with humanity. And that's the Protestant Bruce Metzger uh, commenting on the on the variants. Yes. It's very well, important. Yes, and I, I preach on that often because when you think of a wedding now, what image comes to your mind? Bride and groom. Bride, the, well, no, the bride. You think of the, whoever thinks Especially. of the groom. 
you think the dress, you know, the, and she's coming up, up the altar. Yeah, you think of bride and groom, but the point is, in Scripture, Jesus makes it clear these are bride and groom, but we're never told who the bride is because we are the bride. That's the beauty of it. And it's the same thing in the wonderful parable, uh, you know, of the, 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 the wedding of the king's son, son yes. uh, that, that the invited guests refused to come. Yes. And then they, they, they beat the messengers and kill them. And then everybody is dragged in. There, too, it's the wedding of the son. And there's no bride anywhere in sight. There's That's no right. bride anywhere in sight. That's right. Because the guests, the guests are the bride. The guests are the bride. Well... So. Father Simeon, Erasmo, <laughs> great talking to you. Uh, and we haven't given many specifics about what's actually in these in this book page, but but that's okay. We we you can't summarize four volumes like this in a half hour. And we just want you to know how what a valuable book this is for your prayer life and for your life as a Christian and as a Catholic. So uh, if you haven't read, go ahead. I'll give you the last word. Very, very, no, 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 not the last word. No, but, but just very, line. very, br very briefly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, very, very, very briefly, uh -huh. that that the book, big as it is, I mean, many, many priests in particular have told me that it's been useful for their Sunday homily, but they simply go to the passage in question right. and, and read those pages. Maybe not even all of those, just something to to get them started. So even though they're huge, uh, like a brick, as you say, a uh, doorstop. Um, you don't have to read it from cover to cover. Um, and, and secondly, my intent, as, as I wrote, was to create in the reader's mind and heart an atmosphere of prayer uh, to help the reader as a brother or a sister welcome the word. And in the first volume, uh, already there, I had put as an epilogue uh, the, the quote from Jeremiah 15, 16 that I love, where it says, thy words were found and I ate them and thy words became to me a joy and the delight of my heart. I mean, that that is what carried me through 2,968 pages. I, I added up the four. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, Father Simeon Erasmo. Thank uh, you, thank Father Fasio. And our viewers here. God bless you all and uh, good. have happy, blessed reading. Okay. Bye-bye. God bless.